park. So it's within this 5x5 five five boundary at all times. So if I were to move my Embark rectangle over here to the right, I would get a vastly different readout than if I scan this Embark where we're at. Um, it's scanning the actual Embark location where you're going to embark uh, all of the levels. Now, um, one little nitpicky thing, let's see if I can find an example here. This, this particular area, you'll notice it says some soil. I would expect this area to have uh, multiple layers of soil, not just one. So if I pull up DF hack again and I do that same, that same prospect all here, you'll notice that there's fire clay listed. Now there's only just the one type, but my guess is, is that I would have two layers of fire clay uh, before I actually hit stone. Fire clay is actually a really valuable clay, so those of you who are looking to experiment with ceramics, that's a good, good spot to embark if that's really the only goal you had. Uh, tonight, however, we're going to embark right on that volcano, like I said, because that's the uh, most newbie-friendly area I've found in a long time. Um, if I'm looking for particular features, I'll use Prospect. Uh, I don't really need to use it for this map. I've played on it before. I'm familiar with what's here and, and the general layout we're going to see. Uh, if you're looking for coal, you've turned your metal, your your mineral frequency up high, and you're looking for something that has iron and coal and flux all in the same embark area. Prospect is going to be your best friend. It used to be a few versions ago in Dwarf Fortress, you could actually see a readout of what the f layers of stone you were going to see, just like you see over here. where it lists these layers, you would actually get that layer readout over here instead of this very vague description. At some point, Toadie decided he didn't like the layer readout that everybody was using to figure out what minerals they were going to get, and so this is what we end up with now. Uh, personally, I, you know, I like a little more game to my game than a, than a pure simulation, and so while this is nice for those simulation folks, I'm looking to play a game, but not necessarily... Uh, a sim. Okay, with our uh, with our civilization picked out, our embark location identified and and selected. Make sure that rectangle is where you want it to be, and you hit E to embark. Now I have the warning turned on in the init files we covered earlier, so it warns me in case I accidentally hit the E key that I'm getting ready to embark, and in this case I want to, and it will ask me what embark profile I want to use. Now this is the other init file that I uploaded to the Reddit thread earlier and it lists the goods and skills I'll bring with me. Now, one thing you'll notice when you pull this up, and you will almost invariably have the same problem, is it will warn you and say, hey, I couldn't do what you told me to. I couldn't use that preset. Hit Escape and hit P, and it will list the problems that it ran into while trying to supply your caravan exactly like you told it to. And this is a long-standing bug with Dwarf Fortress. It tells me there's no cave fish. Well, when I hit Escape and I hit Tab to get over to the items screen, and I hit N to pull up a new item, and I go to fish, lo and behold, there's cave fish. I like using cave fish for my embark solely because it's easy to, easy to keep track of. It's separate from meat, it's separate from plants, and it makes it easier for me to keep track of how much of my embark supplies are remaining to me later. Now, let's go ahead and cover, before we get too much into the uh, items, let's go back a step. When you first come in, you're going to actually be looking at a set of dwarves. And those of you who want to pick your dwarves based on, you know, their preferences, you can hit the view key and go in and find out all about your dwarves, what they like, you know, kind of get a sense for what they're good at and what they're bad at. Uh, Iton here has an iffy memory and a shortage of patience, for example, so she's probably not good for something that requires high memory or a lot of patience. Um, they'll tell you what they like. So, for example, Iton likes lignite, bras, red diamond spears, gauntlets, earrings, spiked balls, and ducks for their quacks. Uh, it'll tell you what they like to eat and drink whenever possible, and it will warn you about some type of vermin that they don't like. All of your dwarves have this basic level of detail uh, built into them by default. So, for example, Lytast here is almost never sick, which would make him really good to put in the military because he'd be less prone to infection if he got wounded. But he's clumsy, so he's not going to be really good at handling a weapon when we first start him out. Uh, it'll tell you how old they are, when they were born, all sorts of history. Frankly, when I embark, I'm a merciless overlord, and I, am, I assign all my dwarves to whatever jobs I'm going to assign them. These first seven don't get a choice. 
they just get whatever I need. In particular, I assign four of them to be uh, miners at skill five, as high up as I can get, and you can use the, uh, the plus and minus key here to change their settings. Everything you add to a dwarf or to your wagon will use up the embark points you start with in your setting. Um, so, for example, as we go here and I make him a proficient miner, that uses up embark points and we're left with zero. If I were to pull a few of these out, I could go back to having s persons with less skill in mining and maybe add more items. Or I could uh, remove all the skills from my dwarves and have lots more items. Or I could even remove all of the items and I could add to my dwarves. Now, there's a limit to how far up you can actually raise a dwarf. A single dwarf can have no more than 10 skill levels in various tasks by default. So, for example, my Mason Stonecrafter here has five in both of these uh, abilities, but you'll notice he has no skill points left here. I can't actually increase, even if I took skill away from, say, this miner, I can't add it to our Stonecrafter. I can't make him a miner as well. It won't let me. Um, there's a limit to how superhuman your dwarves are allowed to be at Embark. This is just one of those limits. Uh, now, I bring a specific loadout of skills with me when I go, and these first four dwarves over here are uh, all miners. All of them are all miners. So I've got them all at skill five. Um, this fifth dwarf is a mason stonecrafter, and this is a little redundant because typically he'll be doing one or the other and not both. Um, I tend to have my stone cutting dwarves doing both jobs. They're not particularly skilled necessarily at both of them, but I just have them doing both because it's thematically appropriate, not necessarily mechanically efficient. My carpenter is just a carpenter. He's going to spend all of his time working with wood. He's not going to be doing anything else pretty much ever. My farmer, and I do highly, highly, highly recommend taking a grower with you when you embark, is also a weaponsmith. We'll use him to bootstrap our raw materials and produce axes, uh, picks and so forth when we first get underway, as well as uh, some of the first trade goods we'll produce will be produced by our farmer as his, using his weaponsmith specialty. Now, let's hit tab and I'll bounce over to the items that we're going to embark with, and I'll kind of try and walk through why I'm bringing what I'm bringing. Uh, starting with the top here, this anvil I bring because if you don't bring an anvil, the earliest you can conceivably get an anvil is with the first caravan, and there's no guarantee that the first caravan even has an anvil. So if you plan on doing metal at all in the first year, it makes really good sense to bring an anvil. You can't make one on site if you don't already have an anvil. So this is one of those things that I get a choice. I can bring some finished goods with me in the form of an anvil and then make everything else on site, or I can bring no finished goods at all, cross my fingers, and hope real hard that that first caravan is going to bring me an anvil, and there's no guarantee. You could go five years and never see an anvil, at least in theory. Uh, I bring several types of booze. Down here about midway, you're going to see dwarven beer and dwarven rum. I bring wine and ale. But the reason I'm bringing so much of one type and one of the other types is because all of these come with a barrel. So there's a barrel for the ale, a barrel for the wine, a barrel for the beer, and a barrel for the rum. But when the dwarves drink the rum, I now have an empty barrel. When the dwarves drink the beer, I now have an empty barrel. When the dwarves drink the ale, there's a lot more ale to be drunk before we get to the empty barrel. Um, initially, effectively, this gets me three free barrels fairly quickly in the early game. Um, this is one of those little tricks that you can get to pack up additional gear that you're not expecting. Um, I bring seeds with me for all of the major things I plan to plant, and I bring, bring a fair number of each. Uh, we will be building fairly sizable farms right off the bat. We'll be building farms and getting our, our farming operations up and running fairly quickly. I bring logs, even though I'm embarking in a wooded area, specifically so that I don't have to cut wood to get started. If you're embarking in a really heavily forested area, there's a good temptation to just, uh, just bulldoze every tree for miles around, and you can do that, but... These are 30 logs. I don't have to wait for my dwarves to cut. They're ready. As soon as I hit the ground, they're ready to start. If I have to, you know, disassemble the wagon to get logs to make training axes to cut trees, that's that much more delay before I get underway. And if you're embarking in a more savage or evil terrain, the amount of delay it takes for you to get your fortress up and running and defensible matters. In this particular map, it's not as important. We're embarking in a fairly uh, mild area. But if you're going to go try one of those evil areas where, you know, your butchered animals will come back to kill you, 
having your defenses up and running as quickly as possible, getting your stuff underground as quickly as possible matters. And so it's important to think about, well, how long is it going to take me to get trees? Do I really want my dwarves out cutting trees in the middle of an area where skeletons and zombies can come along and kill them while they're trying to get wood? Um, personally, I like bringing some wood just to get started initially. We'll use this, well, we'll use a fair chunk of this before my dwarves have really gotten underway with the wood cutting. Now, these next two are types of stone, and for those of you who are new to Dwarf Fortress and aren't really, you know, up on what a different what the different types of stone are, and believe me, I wasn't when I started either. Malachite is an ore of copper, and Cassiterite is an ore of tin, and copper and tin together make bronze. Bronze is a fairly high quality weapon material. It's not the best, it's about third on the list, generally speaking. Uh, but it can be used to make edged weapons or blunt weapons. It, it can be used to make trap components. It has a fairly high value uh, to it, meaning that it's that if I were to just take the malachite, for example, and make copper weapons, they would be worth less and less viable as weapons than if I take the cassiterite and use the two of them to make bronze and make the weapons out of that. Additionally, because of the way bars and stones and the conversion ratios between these work, bringing malachite and cassiterite will get me a lot more bronze than I would get if I just took uh, the malachite alone. And since it's bronze, it's going to end up being better for me overall in terms of both value and for what I'm building out of it. We're going to take a couple of stones with us. I choose gabbro because, well, I just like gabbro. Um, Gabbro is magma safe. You can you can expose it to uh, magma; it won't burn up and melt. But we'll be using this to make blocks. The blocks we'll use to build our first workshops and so forth. Um, I don't need much of it. Uh, we'll get stone fairly quickly once we start mining. But the first few workshops I build, I'm going to use uh, Gabbro for my smelters and my forges. We're going to make this into blocks. Each stone, since we're taking two of them, will convert to four blocks, and we'll get a lot of blocks very quickly more than we'll need for our for our first few workshops. Uh, thread, I take silk thread with me when I embark. It's not, it's rare that I get a mood that requires silk in the first three months, but it has happened that I get a mood when I'm not expecting it, and I don't have any silk, and he needs silk, and he goes nuts. Or I, the first caravan, I just can't get my trade made, and in the second year I get a mood, and there's no silk in the work, in the fortress, and I've got to get the dogs out to kill one of my dwarves. And it's sad. We want to avoid it. So I take a little bit of silk with me when I embark. Now, you'll notice I'm taking a large quantity of milk, but I'm only taking about one of each type. Like with the booze, this is a handy trick for getting additional barrels right off the bat. Um, you'll use barrels uh, primarily for certain types of jobs. There's only a few that you actually need barrels for. Well, you mostly use rock pots. But by bringing each one of these milk, I can convert the donkey milk to cheese, and the horse milk to cheese, and the cow milk to cheese. And as I make these milks into cheese, I'll free up a barrel for each individual one. If I took 12 donkey milk, I'm only going to have one barrel. But if I take all these different types of milk, I have a barrel for each. And so effectively, I'm, I'm buying myself some free barrels this way. The milk is very cheap. Uh, you can't actually drink the milk. Your dwarves won't touch it. But they can make cheese out of it and eat the cheese. You don't really need to bring plump helmets. I do it primarily just because, well, why not? They're dwarves. But plump helmets are a staple food crop for dwarves. Uh, you'll notice up here at the top I've got plump helmets spawn. That's the seeds for plump helmets. As well as the plump helmets themselves, those are the actual plants. So you'll plant the seeds to get plump helmets. You'll brew the plump helmets and you'll get back plump helmet wine and uh, plump helmets spawn. And that cycle from crop to uh, brewing or milling or processing back into seeds, back into planting, back into brewing, milling or processing forms the core of your food industry. Uh, you don't have to bring any plump helmets with you. There's more than enough in this particular site. There's more than enough uh, uh, surface crops on the just laying around the ground for you to pluck and process. Uh, I like to bring plump helmets to get started fairly quickly. It's just that many more seeds I'm bringing. It allows me to make booze pretty quickly on the, in the early phase. This embark doesn't have any sand, so I brought some with me. Uh, sand, if you're embarking in an area with sand, is a handy way to make an infinite quantity of just about anything you can imagine. Uh, most things in the game can be built from glass, and uh, sand is how you do that. 
I bring it primarily for Windows. Later on, I'll show you folks how to build an animal-powered watchtower, which is a particular trick you can do to help spot intruders. Um, but it's not necessary. Sand is cheap, however, and even if you're not planning to use the sand for glass, sand comes in a bag. So just like with the milk, every one of these bags of sand is coming with an extra bag for free. So even if I dumped out the sand, I've got 10 free bags, and a bag costs 10, but buying a unit of sand with its included bag only costs one point at Embark. So this is another one of those handy tricks where you can pack more gear than what your points tell you you can actually acquire. Now, bituminous coal is a type of, of coal. There are two types, bituminous coal and lignite. Um, this one is the more valuable. It produces more fuel than lignite. Uh, we will use some of our tower cap logs up here to produce charcoal. We will use the charcoal to turn this coal into coke. We will use the coke to smelt the malachite and the cassiterite into bronze. And we will also use the coke to produce bronze items in our forges. Um, coal is very cheap to bring with you initially. Uh, it produces a large quantity of, fu of fuel very quickly. Uh, it's, it's one of those things where it's really nice to have on your map. But we're going to embark in an area with magma, so we're not really going to need it until we get around to steel making. And at that point, I'll import any of it I need, or I'll make the fuel out of charcoal instead. Uh, as I said earlier, I bring cave fish for my initial food. Fish is its own category, separate from meat and plants, and I typically don't have a fishing industry up and running very early, so it becomes very easy to determine how much of my food that I brought with me at Embark is still around versus the food I've started to produce for myself in the form of plants or meat. Now, over here on the right, you're going to see a list of all the different types of animals. There's a huge number of these. I won't go into the details on most of them. I will suggest a few types to bring, and I'll explain why I bring them. Um, I bring dogs. Dogs can be trained into war animals. They provide defense for your fortress, leather, bones, and meat. Um, you can assign them as pets if you really want to, although you will not see me do that. Uh, you'll notice I bring five females and only one male. Well, the reason for that's fairly obvious, but basically it allows your your procreation to proceed much more rapidly. You'll you'll have five females giving birth every every time. Uh, you only need one male to do the job. Uh, I bring a pair of sheep, one female, one male, and I bring a pair of pigs. The the sheep are grazers. They produce meat, bones, leather, wool, milk, which can be made into cheese all from those one type of animal. The pigs are very similar to sheep, except for they don't produce wool. You can milk them, but you can't get wool from them. The advantage to the pigs is that they are not grazers. You can actually station them in a bare stone room and they won't starve to death. Whereas with your sheep and your rams, if you don't have them on, on suitable grazing land, they'll actually starve to death and you'll waste them. Um, once we're up and running, You'll see me initially, you'll, I'll put these folks, these guys here into pastures, and then I'll pretty much just forget about them for a year or two while they reproduce. Eventually I'll go back and I'll start using them for wool, milk, and food products, and bones, and so forth. Now down here at the bottom you're going to run into, uh, the reason I bring sheep and not, for example, alpaca or llama has to do with how many points they cost. Llama and alpaca, alpaca are more expensive, sheep are much cheaper, as are pigs. Um... You'll notice there's no cost break if I go up here to the dogs again. There's no cost break between bringing a puppy and a fully grown animal. And since there's no cost break in bringing the younger dogs, you might as well bring the older ones and just have the adults ready to go when you first get there. Um, down here at the very bottom, though, you're going to run into uh, guinea cock, uh, blue peahen, turkeys. Uh, there's geese here. There's ducks up here at the top. And uh, birds are wonderful. Birds are a fantastic food source. It takes a little bit of time to get them up and running, but they produce eggs like machines. They are a fantastic, hugely voluminous uh, uh, food source once you get them up and running, once you get them cultivated properly. Um, as with the dogs, you'll see I'm bringing five females and one male. Just as with the dogs, this is purely about uh, reproductive capacity. You get more turkeys faster this way by having the females lay eggs and having only one male. Remember, you're spending the same amount of points for the females as the males, so unless you plan on losing the male, you're better off only having the one. I'm willing to take my chances with this. Um, it's possible. I have had fortresses where I started out, a honey badger comes along and eats my male turkey, and I'm screwed until I can get another male. 
but typically your your hens will immediately your hens will immediately become pregnant, but they won't lay eggs until they find a nest box. So if I can get a nest box built, I'm I'm good to go basically right at the beginning. They'll just immediately run in and start laying eggs from the male that fertilized them months and months previous. Um, you can bring any animals you like. All of these have various advantages and disadvantages. I would strongly recommend against, for a new player, taking the larger forms of grazer, so horses, donkeys, bulls, um, the, the various types of camel, uh, the llamas and alpacas. Not only are they expensive, but they take more grazing space individually. Dwarf Fortress is very realistic in terms of how much, well, relatively speaking, it's, it's uh, plausible in terms of how much uh, grazing space a grazer needs. And the bigger animals do require more grazing space, and they can actually eat themselves out of house and home and then starve to death. Uh, while it makes a fantastic way to cull, to cull their excess population, it also means that you can end up with your entire animal industry collapsing if you don't pay attention to it at some point in the future. Uh, generally speaking, I do very well with uh, one non-grazer type in case I have some horrific accident, and a grazer type that supplies all of my needs from animal cloth all the way through uh, uh, milk and cheese and leather and bones. Uh, this is the type of planning, and it, I, guys, I didn't, I didn't pick this up on my first day. This is not the type of of planning you start off with on day one. This is this is many, many, many em embarks of embark, dwarves starve. Well, how do I stop my dwarves from starving? So I embark again, and now I'm I'm focusing almost exclusively on how to farm. And then, uh, you know, my dwarves get killed in the first goblin ambush. Well, now it's okay, great, I figured out how to farm. How do I keep my dwarves alive when an ambush shows up? And so I've iterated on this for many, 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 many fortresses along the way. It was probably four fortresses in before I realized I could do something like uh, set up walls and a drawbridge and just seal myself in. And at that point, you've basically prevented anything from outside from hurting your fortress at all. Um, the game can actually be played very safely by simply building a fortress with enough food stocks to supply, uh, enough farms to get by on, and then just locking your doors and never letting anybody in. Um, you don't need anything I'm bringing here. People actually do embarks where they take no no gear at all, and you can survive with nothing. You can survive with just what's on the site. Uh, uh, picking uh, crops to get you through to the first caravan, seizing the goods of the first caravan and using it to start digging your fortress. You literally can start with nothing. Dwarves with no skills, no items, no gear at all, and actually survive. It, it really can be done. Um, this is a fairly conservative... Uh, setup that will take advantage of some of the the quirks about inventory like the milk and the, the the alcohol here that have existed for several versions it takes advantage of the ability to bootstrap into bronze fairly quickly early on uh, and get more metal for your your embark points it takes advantage of the uh the animals the, the types of animals available and kind of maximizes what you can really get for them now uh, for for flavor down here at the bottom, you can name your fortress in your group. So today our, our fortress was going to be named Orb Frills. If I hadn't randomized it, I could be Slapshot or Fortress Dreamed or Bolts Portal, uh, Boats Hazy, Yearing, Yearling Oil, Lashed Soldiers. Let's do Lashed Soldiers. What do you think, guys? Let's do that. Now we can also name... We can also name our group. In this case, if I embarked right away, my, my group would have been called the Trade of Dales. Uh, I personally like uh, changing this one. Man one of the two I usually pick manually. You can set them, randomize them. It doesn't matter, guys. This is simply a way to uh, identify your dwarves for your own uh, purposes. Hyper Hopper, is my, you say my mic is fuzzing in and out? It's possible I'm just not talking into it clearly. Is that better? Yeah, you can name your fortress Brain Feast, the Feast of Brains. There's all kinds of... Uh, there's there's a vast quantity of these uh, these words that you can pick. I mean, I'm paging down here and I'm barely getting into the, the C's and the F's. A vast, vast number of them. Um, in this particular case, I'm going to select my name manually for our dwarf.
and the Tossiter Barum are ready to uh, embark. Okay, with our, our Dwarves skills set, our gear set up, and our uh, pets assigned, or our animals assigned, we're ready to actually embark. Now, if you're doing this from the start, you can actually hit S down here to save this. This will save it to your Embark Profiles file. That file I exported to you guys on the Reddit thread is exactly what I was saving when I did this initially. So when I first set this up, I actually changed what I wanted to change and hit save so that it would write it out to that file. Um, there is one thing I forgot that I'm going to do a little differently in this Embark. Uh, I'm not going to take cave wheat as much as I have here. I'm going to take rock nuts instead. This is mostly uh, nitpicky. It doesn't have a real impact. There are different types of plants. They are used for different things in your fortress. Uh, rock nuts cannot be brewed, for example. Um, they can, however, be uh, processed. Their leaves can be processed into meals in giant bags of um, uh, giant bags that can be produced in uh, in uh, quantity at that point for meat, making prepared meals. I don't take lobsters and turtles for shells because I don't believe the actual meals produce them. Uh, these are not. Uh, let me back off a couple points here so I've got some spare. The fish you see here are not raw cave lobsters. They are prepared cave lobsters. They don't get shells at spawn anymore. At least they don't. I don't think they do anymore. They used to, in the older versions of Dwarf Fortress, you would take lobsters and fish for shells. Uh, the ones you get at Embark don't have shells. They're just the raw cave lobster meat, basically, with no shells at all. Um, shells are used for various things in... Uh, in uh, creating for moods. You can make crafts out of shells and so forth. Um, you will see me do some fishing. We'll probably end up with mussel shells at some point along the way. Um, Toadie made it a lot less likely to need shells for a mood. I can't actually remember the last mood I require that I had that required it. I don't know if he, he just got rid of moods requiring shells or if um, he... Uh, just made it really, really a lot less likely. I can't remember, honestly, the last time I had a dwarf who had a mood that required shells. Um, I'm guessing that he just got tired of having, you know, entire fortresses crumble because nobody could find any shells no matter where they embarked. Uh, fishing suffers from its own bugs in this particular version, so we'll kind of... I'll touch on it, but I'll I'll do so from a, from a distance. I won't really uh, delve into it too far. Um, with our... Skills, items, and animals all set up, our fortress and group named, we're ready to embark. And so I'll hit the E key and we'll embark. This will be our new home. <laughs> and for you new players starting in, don't skip past this too quickly because although this uh, although this looks like a, uh, a you know just a plain text screen, there's actually a little tidbit right here that tells me I can expect to see cougars on my map. And not the kind you might find at your local bar. These cougars could conceivably hurt your dwarves. Generally speaking, they'll run away. But if they're cornered or wounded, you could actually get one of your dwarves mauled by a cougar. So we'll skip past that screen and we'll come up to the actual embark. And I'll kind of give you guys an overview of uh, the, the area we're embarking in. What you can expect to see. Uh, the, uh, you know, a kind of an overview. Since since I'm using a tile set and you're, this is not what you would see in the ASCII, those of you who are familiar only with the ASCII might find this a little weird at first. Uh, please ignore the white as before. This is just uh, an issue of Windows 7 and Dwarf Fortress not playing together well. Now, before we do anything else, I'm going to zoom way out and kind of crush our screen down here a little bit. This little blob here in the middle is our wagon. This pit-looking hole up here is the volcano mouth. This light blue strand is our brook. These darker blue uh, spots are ponds on the surface. Um, as I zoom back in here, you're going to see... This is our wagon combined with, around, with, surrounded by dwarves, birds, pigs. Here's a dwarf miner, there's a dwarf mason. Trees, various types of shrubs, and so forth. 
Now, uh, initially, the way I like to start is I like to take all those raw goods I brought and I'll bootstrap myself. Uh, this is the Phoebus tile set um, I'm using. Some folks like Mayday, there are a vast quantity of tile sets out there. I find this one both clean and adequate to my needs. I can immediately tell at a glance what I like, what I don't like, the difference between various types of metals and ore stones. This one is the one I picked up uh, somewhere around version 3112, and I've been using it ever since. Um, this is really the, uh, the the tile set that I've been using pretty much indefinitely. I, I tried out Mayday and some of the others. I even tried ASCII when I first started. Um, it wasn't until I got a tile set that I liked that I was really able to start making headway for a Dwarf Fortress. Um, your mileage may vary. Um, this, this game is very heavily customizable. What I like is not necessarily what you're going to like. Uh, feel free to experiment to your heart's content. Now, initially, since we're bootstrapping from raw materials, we have nothing. We have no tools. We can't cut trees. We can't dig holes. We can't do squat except build with the raw materials we brought with us. So the first thing I'm going to do before we even get started on anything else is I'm going to hit the V key and build. I'm going to hit W for a workshop, and I'm going to get us a carpenter's workshop with C. Carpenter's workshops take wood and produce wood goods. I'm going to make the first one out of tower cap logs that we brought with us. Likewise, I'm also going to build a mason's workshop so we can convert those first few stones we brought into blocks. So those two tower cap logs there are going to be assigned to uh, be used for those workshops. Now, here's where we get the counters at the bottom left for those of you who are, uh, are, are following along. This is a plugin from DF Hack called Dwarf Monitor. This in real time displays uh, the happiness of my dwarves from ecstatic on the right all the way back to about to go berserk and kill people on the left. Uh, dwarves start out right here. This is ecstatic, happy, content, fine, uh, unhappy, very unhappy, and going to stab a dude. Uh, Dwarf Monitor has been out a little longer than yesterday, but he's been updating it frequently. Uh, the plugin got posted on Reddit the other day. I tried it. I like it. It's fantastic. Uh, this is a carpenter's workshop and a mason's workshop. Um, you'll notice that I've got the game paused, so nothing is really happening just yet. Um, Dwarf Monitor has additional functions beyond this, but but Dwarf Therapist is what I was using for this all along, and I don't have to tab out to keep an eye on this with Dwarf Monitor, which makes it really, really handy for me personally. Now, before we really get underway, now is when I have to start talking about Dwarf Therapist. For those of you who've never seen it before, this is Dwarf Therapist, and it is effectively a labor tool for your dwarves. Um, it modifies the memory state of Dwarf, of Dwarf Fortress directly. Uh, it will literally connect to the DF process, and I'm going to read that memory state into Dwarf Therapist. And here are my seven dwarves that I currently have. Their labors and the numbers represent their skills. Um, so I have four miners. I have a carpenter, a mason who is also a stone crafter, a farmer who is also a weaponsmith. It will tell me what their job is, whether they're male or female, how happy they are, what they're doing at the moment, their names. If I point at them, the splinter mine version of it will tell me stuff about that particular dwarf. I can pull up the details on them. I can do all sorts of things to kind of uh, dig into what my dwarves like, don't like, and so forth. So over here in the Dwarf Details tab, this is my Weaponsmith Grower. It tells me what he likes. It tells me what items he likes, his food and drink, his dislikes. These are all things you can get out of the base Dwarf Fortress game. I don't require Dwarf Therapist to play, but it is a fantastically user-friendly tool by comparison to the, to the base uh, user interface. I give Toadie major props for building a wonderfully complex, deep, game uh, full of randomized emergent gameplay, but Dwarf Therapist, without it, I just don't play Dwarf Fortress. When they get a new version of Dwarf Fortress, I literally just take a break and wait. And when the guys from Dwarf Therapist get their memory layouts updated for the new version, that's when I go back to playing Dwarf Therapist. It's To me, it is that crucial uh, to play. I can play without DF Hack if I have to. I don't even try to play without Dwarf Therapist. As an example, Let's say I wanted to assign a dwarf labor, and it's been a long time since I did this manually, so bear with me here. You hit the V key to pull up a dwarf or a, or a thing. You go to the dwarf you want to pull up. You tell him, okay, I want to, let's see, I want to set his labor, and so you go into his labor. No, it wasn't in there. Um, you can set, um, let's see, where was it? There's his labors. 
God, it's been forever and a day since I had to do this manually. <sighs> There's two of them here. There's the dwarf standing on top of him. It's been so long since I did this manually, I can't on I couldn't honestly remember how I do it. It's preferences, and then you set his labors, then you go in here and you turn each one of them on and off manually. And hauling is actually a menu, and it's hideous. Uh, you know, I I'd love to be able to tell you, yeah, do this, you can be a real man if you do it, but you know what? If you want to give yourself carpal tunnel, go to town. I don't even try. Don't bother. I go over to Dwarf Therapist, and I do it all in Dwarf Therapist, because it's literally just a click away. If I want to make my planter able to do butchery, there, I've done it. One button. I don't have to mess around with it. I hit commit, he can do butchery. It's that simple. This is a fantastic tool. Um, I strongly recommend it. You can use it for finding out about your... Uh, this, this is the Splinter Mind fork, for those of you who may have seen the, the base version of Dwarf Therapist previously. This will list... Uh, the attributes your dwarves have above or below average, uh, whether they're better or worse at various skills as they practice up. Um, personally, I don't mind tabbing out of the windowed mode of Dwarf Fortress, as you can see. I've, I've, you know, I'm windowed out, so I can just tab back and forth. If I want to look at the social roles, right now my dwarves haven't started socializing yet, so they're basically blank slates here. Um, I have a custom tab I've built that allows me to immediately access hauler labors without having to scroll the bar all the way to the right if I want to do that. Uh, roles will tell you what people are good or bad at. So, for example, this guy here is a real superhuman kind of dwarf who's pretty much good at everything I conceivably want to make him at, except uh, appraising. So I probably don't want to have him be my broker. But beyond that, he's pretty much good at everything. Now, to what degree you actually care about these things? Personally, I don't dig into roles. I don't care whether they're, you know, the best swordsman or the best uh, stone carver on the planet. I really don't. With enough practice, they're going to get good at it, whether they want to or not. It's kind of like your parents making you eat your veggies. So, initially, I've got, you know, my seven dwarves here and their basic tasks. But one of the few things I do is I bootstrap, which means that a lot of the tasks I want to get done are not things that my dwarves come set to do by default. So, for example... I'm going to set my miners to do wood cutting, because right now I don't have any picks. I couldn't possibly mine if I wanted to. I'm going to set my miners to do wood burning, so I can make charcoal, and I'm going to set them to do furnace operating, so that I can run my smelters. I'm also going to set my mason to run smelters as well, and do wood burning as well, but I won't give him wood cutting, just the other jobs. I'll go ahead and commit those and go way out here on the right. All the way out here on the right is one of the skills that gets overlooked really, really easy. Um, architecture is actually a much more important skill in terms of having somebody able to do it than it first appears. Generally speaking, I don't care if somebody is skilled at architecture, I make everybody an architect. Now, one of the things that's a little counterintuitive for you humans in the real world is that dwarves can do everything. There are good dwarves who are better at some things than others, but dwarves can literally do any task right out of the womb. The moment they hit adulthood, if you want to make that dwarf a mason, he starts off at a base skill level, and he can perform all masonry tasks at that skill level. Um, as he practices and continues to do masonry, he'll get better at it. Eventually, he'll be really, really good at it. But all dwarves, by default, can do all jobs. So specialization is really about which dwarf you pick and how often he does whatever job you've set him to do. Um... Dwarf Therapist does have some of the uh, options here, allow you to do various things that cheat. Uh, I have this still set from back when vampires were the, like in every migrant wave had a vampire in it, um, where it'll highlight my dwarves if I get any that are vampires. You can allow labor setting on children, for example. Uh, I don't really worry about children too much since I have children pretty much disabled. If you're playing with kids, I don't see any reason why you couldn't tell your kids to haul bricks, so feel free to go nuts here. Uh, what you consider to be cheating or don't, that's up to you guys. You're going to see me do all sorts of uh, all sorts of things that are to my personal preferences, not necessarily the uh, the best vanilla gameplay for for the purists out there. Now, once I've got all these labors set, I'm actually ready to start doing stuff. It's been an hour and a half 
just getting your your uh, your setup to this point uh, as I follow along with this tutorial, and I'm actually ready to start doing real stuff. When I unpause the game, my carpenter and my mason are going to immediately run over and grab logs and start building their workshops. Now, once those workshops are built, I pause the game again, and I set my carpenter's workshop with Q to add the task to make a few training axes. Due to a real oddity of Dwarf Fortress, wooden training axes cut trees just fine. And I make about 10 of those to start. Um, my mason, I'm going to add blocks, and I'm going to put that task on repeat, which would be R key. This will tell him to, this will tell a mason to come along and start making blocks, and don't stop until you either run out of blocks, or until you run out of stones, or the world ends, your, your workshop gets destroyed. Uh, the reason I make so many training axes, for those of you who are asking, I don't need them for this group. I really only have four guys who are actually going to cut, and I could skip six of these and I could get started on other things. But when I make the when I make the ten axes, I actually my haulers later on will do a lot of my wood cutting, and so I'm actually going to see use for those ten axes down the road. It's easier just to go ahead and make ten of them now than to worry about hey, did I remember to make more axes later? Um, it doesn't take long to make a training axe. It doesn't get my miners busy any faster cutting trees. It just means that later on I don't have to think about you know my haulers needing them down the road. Uh, if I wanted all my haulers to have training axes way down the road, I'd actually have to have a lot of them, uh, a lot more than this, just this base 10. Uh, now, training axes are nice, but I need to tell my dwarves how to use them, and in order to do that, I designate with the D key, chopping trees with the T key, and I go through and I pick out an area. So I hit enter, and I move my cursor to the area I want, and then I move my cursor up to define a rectangle, and I hit enter again, and it marks all the trees in that area for cutting. So all of those brown marked trees right there that you can now see are going to be felled by people with axes at that point. When I unpause the game, my carpenter immediately gets busy making axes. My mason immediately begins making blocks. Now that's about as much as I can do to start. Uh, my miners immediately start grabbing axes as soon as they're ready. They go off and they start cutting trees, which is just what I want them to do at this point. If I were a real hard case about having all of my dwarves doing something all of the time, I probably could have picked some plants or done something. Having a couple idlers here right at the very beginning doesn't hurt me that much. Um, I'm not really going to get much from using them up perfectly efficiently anyway. Now, my mason has identified that he ran out of stones because he's used up the two... Um, you can't have mining and woodcutting at the same time. Dwarf Therapist, uh, I don't know if you guys caught that. I didn't cover it. Dwarf Therapist actually turns off mining when I turn on woodcutting. You you can't uh, set both at once. If I set mining, it turns off woodcutting. If I set woodcutting, it turns off mining. In addition, you can't set hunting and either one of those either because this requires a crossbow, this requires an axe, this requires a pick, and your dwarf won't use them all at the same time. There's a... Uh, a limitation currently in Dwarf, For Dwarf Fortress about what they can all do at once. Um, with, uh, let's see, with my guys chopping trees and out of bricks, it's now time to build up my forges and smelters. So let's go ahead and build a work, a smelter, a furnace with E, um, a wood furnace because we're going to need to make some charcoal to prime our forges. We're going to need a smelter to produce coke and bronze. And then we're going to need a workshop forge to convert the bronze into actual usable items. That will take our anvil and our gabbro blocks. Uh, like I said, if you don't bring an anvil with you, you're absolutely dancing on uh, whether or not you're going to get stuff down the road. Uh, Esco, I will cover dwarf machinery and pumping. It probably won't be tonight. Uh, if you're following along from the Reddit forums and you're looking for things uh, that are probably a little further down the road, I typically knock off about 9 o'clock or 9.30-ish. Uh, I'll pick up either tomorrow or Wednesday or some point later this week, and I'll be doing a series of these that builds on one another on this same site for, I'll do 6 or 8 or 10 episodes or whenever I get bored of it, up through a thriving fortress before we're finished. Um, this set of workshops here, um, what I really wanted to cover here, is... The, you'll notice that this wood furnace doesn't just need wood burning to be constructed, it actually needs architecture, as does the smelter. Um, if you don't turn architecture on, your dwarves will never actually get 
uh, these buildings built. They'll just sit there and stare at them. doesn't matter that you told them they could burn wood. They can burn wood, but they're not allowed to design the building in which they burn wood. Welcome to Dwarf Fortress. Uh, with architecture on, my idlers will start designing those, those buildings, and we'll get those buildings up and running. So my weaponsmith goes and builds the weaponsmith. My mason designs the two buildings that he needs. And at this point, I'm now ready to start producing uh, metal goods. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to make some charcoal to prime our forges. Uh, this unit of charcoal will then turn around and we'll use the smelters to make coke. We'll use the coke to make the actual bronze. So our mason, who we assigned to do wood burning, you'll notice he didn't have any actual skill at wood burning when we started. You'll see he, he's not got any Z, he's got a no skill listed here. Um, when he finishes, he'll have a zero. So, for example, my miners who've started cutting wood are now dabbling uh, woodcutters. They've got a little bit of experience with it already. Um, the more experience they get, the faster they get. In some professions, like weaponsmithing, the higher skill they get, the more quality you'll get. Um, a lot of them are not quality-based. Woodcutting, dyeing, soap-making, potash-making, a lot of these things don't have a quality rating for them. It's about how fast they get the job done or uh, quantity in terms of a more skilled person getting quantity. Um, with that unit of charcoal, as soon as he finishes up here, there, he's done. We'll go ahead and we'll start. And this is where we really bootstrap metal is in the smelter. Uh, we'll bounce down to the second page of stuff here, and I'll page through this. And on the second page, you're going to find... Uh, produce coke from bituminous coal that we brought with us and I'll put that on repeat and then I'm also going to add make bronze bars from ore and I'll put that on repeat and so now what will happen is we'll take the single unit of charcoal we'll make some coal into coke then we'll use the coke to make bronze then we'll use some of that coke to make more coke and then we'll use that coke to make more bronze and we'll keep doing that indefinitely until we run out of coke and or bronze. And so we'll we'll convert all of our coal and all of our ores directly into coke and bronze. And I can basically just ignore that guy and he's going to be busy from here on in making fuel and bronze at this point. Uh, my carpenter is probably nearing up finishing. I want to make some other things. I need to make a couple of buckets, a couple of cages. Um... I'm going to want to start making bins and beds, and those are important things. Beds can only be built out of wood, aside from a special mood, which you can't control. So beds, in order to have your dwarves sleeping in a bed at all, you're going to have to have wood. That's another reason why I bring wood with me. Even if I didn't cut any wood, I've got enough wood to actually make a few beds to get a basic dormitory built. Uh, even if I just dug a hole out and dumped the wagon into it, I would end up with some wood inside my fortress, uh, enough to at least get to limp by on. As you can see, the uh, miners are about a third of the way done with this chunk of uh, trees. Our uh, mason has started moving the, bron the uh, malachite and the cassiterite to the smelter to produce bronze. If I hit the T key, I can look into a workshop and see what its contents are. So, for example, here's a bunch of training axes. This one is empty. This one's got coke and the cassiterite malachite that he's currently using. So he's going to use a unit of coal, which is why it's tasked, along with a unit of cassiterite and a unit of malachite, which are also tasked, to do whatever action it is he's doing with Q. So if I pull Q up, it tells me that he's right now he's making bronze bars, which is why it's active on repeat. This allows you to control what your workshops are doing at any given point. Uh, later on, I'll show you how to use the manager to, auto to automate and workflow plugin from DF Hack to automate some of these processes a lot further than what we've seen so far. But for these initial jobs, there's you're going to see me do a lot of things manually just to get started. Uh, we'll make bronze picks since we've got started. And as with the axes, I probably make a few more than I actually need. You do get more bronze if you make it from... It doesn't matter whether you make it from bars or ore. Uh, the advantage to making it from ore is you go fewer smelter reactions. So if I smelted my my bronze in or my copper into bars and then I smelted my tin into uh, or my cassiterite into tin and then I smelted my copper with my tin to make bronze I would get the same number of bars if I do it from ore the advantage is to doing it this way it does it quicker and you use less fuel um, 
if you were wanting to make bismuth bronze, you have to make it from bars because you can't use the ore of bismuth directly in the reaction. You have to use bars. Uh, they made it. They made a change a couple of versions ago where it used to be that you would get more bronze if you made the copper and the tin separately and combined them. But with the recent changes to mining in version 34, uh, you get four bars of bron four bars for each ore. So since there are two ores in making my bronze, I get eight bronze bars. If I convert the copper the copper ore to copper and the tin ore to tin, I get four of each. And then when I do those, I end up with with the same eight bars back again. Good question, though. I can tell there's a few people who've played Dwarf Fortress in the past who are uh, looking to maybe review things that they didn't know along the way. That's awesome. If you guys can think of anything I'm not covering as I go, just feel free to go ahead and shout it out in the chat. and I'll address it if it's something that... Uh, that the new players really need to, to be aware of. Now, at this point, our weaponsmith, our farmer, has made three picks. Once he gets his fourth pick ready, we're going to be ready to actually start digging our fortress. I'll probably let the miners finish up those last few trees, but we're going to be ready. And, and where I'm going to site my fortress is right above the wagon here, right a little north of the wagon, right in this area here that's pond-free, so to speak. Um, we'll have a use for some of these ponds. It's close to the brook, so I'll have access to the brook for fishing. It's not too terribly far from the volcano for magma access, and it's close to the wagon for getting my stuff underground. Um, all of these are considerations of various importance depending on where you are embarking and what terrain you are in and what you are dealing with. For this particularly mild site, I've got lots and lots of time, probably the first year at least, before I would even see a hostile intruder of any sort beyond maybe thieves. Um, now, one of the tools that you that's a little bit on the cheaty side, uh, if you're using it all the time, but it's nice for new players to be able to see how the world really looks underground, is a tool called Reveal. And I'm going to go ahead and show you Reveal here real quick while I've got the game paused. Um, if I hit Reveal, over here you don't notice anything different, but if I go down a level, now you can see the soil underneath me, and the rocks underneath that, and the ores underneath that, and so here are all the different veins of ore as we go down, and there are gems here in various little, you know, concentrations and little clusters as we go on down further, further, further. This is a, this is not an ore, it's a type of stone. Uh, a little further, this is marble, which works as a flux, along with cobaltite. Um, if I go even further down, you start to see the caverns emerge. There's water in the caverns, there are mushroom trees, uh, there's some silk on the ground. If I keep going on further down, eventually I'll hit the second cavern layer. There's the second cavern layer. This world only has two caverns. Eventually I'll go all the way down to the bottom and I'll hit the Magma Sea. And that's pretty much the bottom of the world as far as everybody's concerned. Um, this embark was created uh, not for this tutorial, but it was created by somebody on Reddit. I s found it. I like flat volcanoes. I picked it up. I've played with it half a dozen or more times, just, you know, screwing around with this particular map. Um, I've seen it enough times at this point that I kind of have an idea of what I'm expecting, what what I'll see when I get to a point. Um, while it's not necessarily the most enjoyable for me as a player, for tutorial purposes, it's excellent. Um, it it allows me to provide a fairly, uh, a fairly predictable experience for the folks watching at home, so I can kind of get an idea of what I'm going to be able to cover in each session. Makes it a little easier to actually provide a tutorial for you guys there at home. Now, one thing you want to watch out with Reveal is Reveal can cause some bugs if you run the game with it on. So if you use Reveal to take a peek, I strongly recommend turning it off before you actually do anything. Um, you can use Reveal to help you when you're laying out your fortress. If you're if if you're one of those folks who thinks your dwarves should kind of have an idea of what's on the other side of that wall, you know, the D&D &D version of stone cunning or whatever, Reveal kind of gives you the ability to peek and see what's what's actually there before you actually start mining it out. Some people like it. Some people regard it as cheating. As with everything in a single-player game, it's really up to you guys. I just show it to you so you can kind of get an idea of how the world is laid out in general as you go down through the layers of stone of your world. Um... This, this vein and cluster structure that you're going to see here with this being the layer stone and this being a cluster of, of microcline pierced by veins of hematite here and here. Um, this type of vein and cluster structure 
is common. If I zoom all the way out, for example, you can see that that structure repeats itself more or less over and over again. Um, yeah, some folks don't like rainbow dining rooms, so they, they want to be able to monitor what types of stone they're digging through at any given point. Uh, personally, I don't care. I got over that bit of OCD a long time ago. I like being able to dig out a, a perfectly engraved dining room more than I care about whether it's all one color or not. I figure dwarves would, would be perfectly at home with having a vein of colored stone running through their running through their dining room. Well, otherwise, why live underground, right? So um, I'm going to go ahead and turn off Reveal here. I, I really don't need it for purposes of laying out this fortress. Like I said, I've kind of seen this map before. Um, it it's, doesn't have a whole lot of surprises for me that we're going to see anytime soon. Um, with Reveal off, you get the Fog of War effect. So here is the surface, then as I go down, you can see I don't know what's here. This could be anything. Um, the Beyond the little randomized color bits, which don't tell you anything, it's just uh, to make the Fog of War more appealing. You can see the, the ponds, because I can see them from the surface, but I have no notion of what's down deeper below that if I've never seen it before. Uh, we're going to go ahead and I'm going to lay out my fortress, and I'll kind of try and walk you through this, but I have to juggle a lot of keys, so bear with me if I get a little quiet here as I'm digging out. Okay, now I use this, uh, let me explain here, this big square here is eventually going to become a pasture space for my animals, and our fortress proper is going to become a sort of an, uh, an inverted skyscraper in this section um, that, that we'll use. But this is a great opportunity for me to introduce one of the other DF hack tools I use, Dig Circle. Now that designates a simple circle of radius 15 for me automatically. You can do it manually, it just takes a lot more key presses. It's not actually doing anything for you that you couldn't get otherwise. Um, personally, I find that anything I can do in, Dia, in Dwarf Fortress to minimize key presses, it's just that important because frankly there's a lot of button pushing anyway and the less I have to do, the better. Uh, we're going to dig out uh, another section here, but one of the neat things that you can do with uh, dig circle. If I pull up the hotkeys menu with shift H and I go to the shift F8 hotkey and I tell it its name is dig circle I can use that hotkey and it will automatically hit DF hack for me. So for example I'll center my circular room here and hey presto shift F8 activates that hotkey DF hack recognizes that it's actually a command and I get a circle. Uh, if you create hotkeys for rooms, you may see DF hack reporting error messages. Hey, I don't know what dining room is. Hey, I don't know what gate is. That's because those aren't really commands. DF hack is just monitoring them and trying to use them as commands in case you've added a command like this. I'll use that later for dig V as well to make it simpler to dig out veins of ore. But initially we use it primarily just to get this, this set of fortress rooms up and running. I'll also create a, a second pasture off the right here uh, strictly for other grazers. Uh, when you hold down the shift key as you're moving, you may have noticed I jump uh, about 11 squares. Shift and an arrow moves 11 squares in a in a jump, basically, a shift move. Uh, three shift moves across by three shift moves down is the largest space you can designate as a zone or a stockpile when we get to that point. So there really is a method uh, to the madness of this particular size of room. Uh, we'll be using one for grazers and the second one for grazers slash pigs if I need overflow capacity. Uh, the dig circle command has other uses for those of you who are ooing and aahing there in the chat box about uh, DF hack for the dig circle command. You can use it to designate any size. Uh, particularly good sizes I find are 15 for a reasonably sized circle that you can put lots of workshops in and lots of storage space in. Uh, 31 is a space that equates to this 3x3 shift move size. 
So if I were to dig circle in the center of this room, it would give me a 31 by 31 would be would be a circle whose edges touched the edges of this square. Uh, that's as large as you can conceivably cover with a stockpile in the terms of a circular room. So that can come in handy later on. Uh, you'll see me use that for furniture stockpiles, which don't use bends or barrels or so forth. However, that's getting a little ahead of ourselves. Now, up here on the surface above our fortress that I've kind of designated here, we're going to need to dig a staircase down, 